And let me introduce to you Miles Bard, the co-founder and chief technology office, officer of Ubiquitous Energy. Welcome to Miles. Thank you very much. I actually didn't say that, but this event is much better. And the, the weather here in Greece is beautiful, the sunshine, uh, the food is delicious. I'm uh, thrilled to be here and um, talk a little bit about sustainability. Um, I want everybody to imagine for a second, what if every surface around us could generate its own invisible, renewable electricity? This is actually the question that inspired me when I was at MIT uh, about 10 years ago and thinking about starting a company. I was thinking about kind of where do we use energy? We use it really throughout our lives. We use it to power our buildings, to power our phones, our devices, our computers, to power our automobiles, our cars. Really, really everything in our society is powered by electricity or energy. And so I was thinking, what if we could generate the energy that we consume on site, on the surface of all, of all of these products? What if our windows could power our buildings? What if the windshield of our car could give us some extra range when it's parked? What if the surface of our smartphone could give us some extra charge for an emergency call if we place it out in the sun? This is all possible with a technology that we created called Truly Transparent Solar. This is actually a picture of a solar panel. It might look like a piece of glass, but it actually is a solar panel. If you connect wires to the edge of this, it will produce electricity in sunlight, just like an ordinary solar panel would. But it's really completely invisible. Um, and this is a totally new technology that we've developed at a, a company that I co-founded out of MIT, Ubiquitous Energy. We're first using this technology to turn buildings into essentially vertical solar farms. You're probably all familiar with the picture on the left here. Uh, this is a solar farm, traditional solar farm. And the picture on the right is a building in Calgary in Canada. Um, it's called the Bow Building. And we've actually rendered this with our technology. Now, if you were to visit this building, it would look exactly like this. And that's the point. Our technology is designed to blend in and be incorporated into our building materials. It's kind of a sustainable way to generate electricity with the surfaces that we're already using in our built environment. So a little bit about, about Ubiquitous Energy, and then I'll talk a little more about sustainability. Um, we co-founded Ubiquitous Energy in 2012 out of MIT. Shortly after that, I, I spoke at the GSW in Estonia, and I'm really thrilled to be back here again and tell you kind of a little bit about the evolution of our company. Um, in 2011, I actually was in a class uh, with Bill Aulette, who taught me and, and my, my uh, colleagues at the time kind of the foundations of discipline on entrepreneurship, which I know was part of the agenda yesterday. So a lot of the ideas that you've learned about here have been incorporated throughout the, the journey of ubiquitous energy. And, we probably forgot about some where we should have remembered them um, and kind of taken this tortuous path to where we are today. Um, but we, we raised our Series A in 2015 and set up our headquarters uh, in Silicon Valley. So we're based in the Bay Area in Redwood City uh, where we developed this, this technology today. Um, then we scaled up the technology into a pilot manufacturing in 2019. Uh, we started installing this glass in first, um, in first projects around the world. Um, and today we're actually working with our glass industry partners to scale up this, this production and manufacturing to full-scale production that can be incorporated into glass manufacturing facilities around the world. Um, so this is a, lo a long path, this is 10 years, um, and I think this highlights kind of one of the lessons that, that I think is important for entrepreneurship, which is persistence. Um, this wasn't all easy, there were hard times here, there were times when funding was hard to come by, there were times where we couldn't quite find the right you know, product market fit, where the technology didn't work. Um, but in each of those cases, we kind of pushed through because we saw the huge opportunity um, that we, we envisioned with we, creating this sustainable technology. So a little bit kind of about the, the starting point here and how, how we got here. I would say that there are kind of four different, um, four different parts of this that um, I would like to think we're very linear, but it wasn't really the case. We had this hypothesis, which is, you know, what if every surface could generate renewable electricity? We kind of had this idea that solar technology had more opportunity than the way it was currently being deployed, and if we could create technology solutions um, to overcome those, 
we might be able to find new ways to deploy solar technology that had you know, market potential and had a, a, a sort of economic prize at the end. Um, so we, we also had technology. I mentioned, you know, I, I have a PhD in chemical engineering uh, from MIT, and I got excited about solar technology there uh, while I was doing research on new types of solar technologies way before I'd even thought about entrepreneurship. And, you know, we like to think, you know, you come up with a problem and then you build a product uh, to meet that problem, you know, with a solution. That wasn't quite the case in, in my, my case because I was a, kind of a technologist to start and then, you know, kind of worked backwards into, okay, well, now, is there a, is there a fit for this? Is this worth, um, you know, starting a company and, and developing into a, a, you know, mass product? And that comes to the, the second two points, which is impact and uh, market fit. Um, you know, impact is really what gets me up in the morning. Um, the potential to change the way we generate and use electricity and energy um, is a huge, huge, um, you know, problem facing, facing our world today. Um, and we sought to create a technology that could have as big of an impact as, as possible with something that didn't exist uh, in the market. And, you know, the market part was, is also there, which is, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to different customers in different segments. I mentioned, you know, automobiles, agriculture, buildings, consumer electronic devices. The, the list goes on and on. We didn't really know where we wanted to start, so we talked to customers in, in all of those spaces. And I would say over the trajectory of ubiquitous energy, we've kind of spiraled you know, starting at the perimeter of this, this plot, and we've spiraled through all of these ideas, you know, as we kind of refine each one and kind of have landed on a place where we think, think we've kind of got a great technology that meets a huge impact and has, you know, customers on the other side saying they're, they're ready for this and willing to pay for it. And I, I think that kind of spiral uh, analogy is more how I would, I would view the path we've taken rather than a perfectly linear, um, a linear path. So I want to kind of dive into the impact part of this and sustainability in general. Um, this picture probably evokes some feelings uh, to you. Um, I imagine you're, you're thinking renewable energy, um, you know, th this might be a way that we could power certain parts of our society without, um, without greenhouse gas emissions or maybe in a more renewable way than we currently generate most of our electricity as a society. Um, so as we're kind of thinking about where, where we can focus or where we can build you know, products and technologies to, to be sustainable, um, it's important that we look at kind of where we are today. Where do we generate electricity and energy and where do we consume it? So on the left-hand side of this plot is all the sources of, of energy today. At the top are renewable technologies. The little tiny one at the top is solar. Uh, at the bottom is petroleum. Um, and then on the right-hand side, um, kind of not quite to the right, the pink boxes are, are different segments of our, our society where we use, use energy. So residential, commercial, industrial, transportation's a big one. And you can kind of see where each of these energy streams are flowing. And then on the far right, our two boxes, the, the dark gray box is the actual energy used to power the function. So the energy used to actually power the car or to turn the light bulb on in your house. But the light gray box is all wasted energy. That's the energy that's lost to heat or to transmission or to inefficiencies in our combustion engines. Um, so what you see here is you actually have two thirds of the energy um, that we produce is wasted. So this can kind of give you a roadmap of different places you might be able to focus. So one would be on the generation side. You could create new technologies um, or focus on expanding the deployment of existing renewable energy technologies to move up to the renewable or sustainable space from the fossil fuels, the petroleum, the natural gas, the coal. Um, the renewable technologies are, are getting more and more market share, but you see they're still a pretty small component of, of what we use. Or we can focus on the other side and think, you know, how do we make the devices we use more efficient? How do we reduce that wasted energy? Uh, we could tackle that through more efficient, you know, engines or more efficient, you know, lighting technologies. Um, or the distribution. So, you know, how do we, how do we generate electricity on site? So this can kind of give you lots of different places you can focus to make a more sustainable, um, um, more sustainable society. So if we think about climate change, you know, a big driver is greenhouse gas emissions. And... 
Um, it's important to kind of look at where, where these greenhouse gas emissions come from. Huge portion of it's transportation. So that's the big wedge there. That's about a third of this pie. Um, dominated by kind of light duty vehicles, which are just your everyday cars. Um, but you also have big contributions from electricity generation and from use in industrial and commercial buildings. So again, it, you know, this is just kind of, if you're thinking about ideas for where you might focus in the sustainability space, all of this pie is, is potential for making our world more sustainable. Um, but if we can focus on the bigger pieces of the pie first, that will give us a bigger impact. So how do we use energy? We use it in our appliances, we use it to grow our food, we use it to cook our food, we use it to heat our houses when they're cold, we use it to drive around our cities, we use it to actually produce the electricity, we use it to manufacture you know, the things that we use, like our cars or our phones or our, our, our buildings. We use it for entertainment and our electronic devices. We use it for lighting. And this is distributed kind of in, in a certain way. Um, another way to look at this is kind of where geographically is, is energy being used. Um, this plot is, is shaded is like from a few years ago, but this is shaded um, by per capita. And you see that certain countries, the US being one, um, have a really high elect energy use um, per person, whereas other, other countries have, have less. If you were to actually scale, scale the plot um, based on the size of the countries, you get a really weird looking map where the US looks really fat and other, other countries look really skinny. Um, and so this is another kind of guidepost for where you might focus to have the biggest impact um, on sustainability um, in terms of where energy is being used. So this year, um, the world consumes around 17 terawatts um, at any given moment. Um, that's a, a power metric. Um, so we round that up to 20 terawatts. Um, it's a huge number, and I think it's, it's kind of hard to fathom what exactly that means. So let's put it into a few, a few analogies here. So one is lighting. Um, so 20 terawatts is the equivalent of 250 billion 75 watt bulbs running all year, all year round. Um, so that's a, a lot of power, a lot of light. Um, this next one I like, and maybe, maybe you can uh, pull yourself here. Um, so we think about food, you know, food has calories, and calories are energy. Um, how many cheeseburgers do you think it takes to power the entire world in terms of their energy content? Um, maybe think about it per person. Oh, you have a good idea? So 20 terawatts, so terawatts is a power metric, so that's the instantaneous power at any moment, um, kind of average throughout the year. So you'd multiply that by the number of hours in the year to get to your, your terawatt hours. Um, the, you know, food has a, a energy content in calories, which is a different, a different way of stating it, a terawatt hour or a kilowatt hour or something like that. Um, okay, raise your hand if you think each one of you needs to eat one cheeseburger per year to power the entire world. At least, let's say at least one cheeseburger. You think it's higher than one cheeseburger? A few people say higher than one cheeseburger. Does anyone say higher than five cheeseburgers per person? I'm talking not just you in this audience, but you and everyone else in the world eating one cheeseburger per year for the entire world. So more than 10? There's some people saying lower, some people still raising their hands more than 10. The answer is 175,000 billion cheeseburgers, which is 70 burgers per day per person. It's a lot, a lot of cheeseburgers and a lot of energy. How about driving in a car? So this is, if you drive in a, a 30, mile per hour, 30 mile per gallon car around the entire Earth once a year per person, that's how much the entire world uses in terms of, of power. So it's a lot. So there's a lot of potential here to have a huge impact if we can power our world with sustainable technologies that are renewable and, and make economic sense. So solar is my passion. Um, ubiquitous energy is all about 
about solar and new types of solar. So I want to kind of focus a little bit on, on solar for a second. Um, this is one, one place that I've personally decided to, to focus in my career, um, but maybe kind of gives you some ideas in the places that, that you want to focus in, in your own. Um, so in looking at solar potential, um, we can kind of stack this up against the global um, energy potential. So we talked about that 16 terawatts, that's this red bar on the, on the side, and that's everything, everything we use, um, including what's wasted, um, including what we use you know, to power our transportation and our buildings and everything like that. If we were electrified everything, that number would be lower, um, but right now this is, this is kind of the, the global energy potential. So what if we used other renewable energy technologies? What if we used hydroelectric? Um, and I'm talking about technologies that are available today. You could implement these right now with available, um, with available technology, available products. What if we dammed every, every river in the world? Um, we generate a bit. We generate a, you know, one or two terawatts, which is, which is meaningful. How about wind? What if we put wind turbines you could look at you know you can look at the maps of wind speeds and you can find the places where you have a high enough wind speed um, to generate uh, wind on terrestrial spaces so on on land um, and you put wind turbines in all of those places you could generate a little bit more now this could go higher if you went into offshore wind or you went into kind of upper atmosphere wind um, but some of the technologies there are still are still being developed um, but these are all cost effective today and we should we should absolutely do this all you know, biomass, what if we turn all of our woody byproducts in, into fuels? Geothermal, we're starting to get more and more, so we're finding the hot spots where we can, we can pull energy out of, out of the earth. Now, if we think about terrestrial solar, so at any given moment, remember we're talking about, we're comparing this to 16 or 17 terawatts. At any given moment, the amount of energy that's hitting the surface of, of the earth from the sun is 180 thousand terawatts. If you take just the land mass, now we're down to 60,000 terawatts. So if we look at the scale bar here, if we plotted all of that energy, this is going to go out the top of, this, top of the slide at about 1,000 feet into the air. That's the energy potential of the sun. So it's not a totally apples to apples yet because we can't harvest all of that energy. There's not enough space and we don't have the technology that's 100% efficient. Now, what if we made that more realistic? What if we, we covered about 1.5% of the Earth, of the, the land space on Earth, which is about the same amount as the area of our roads um, or the rooftop area on all the buildings in the world? At a pretty low efficiency solar technology, you still can generate almost three times as much as, as the Earth uh, uses. And this is kind of like what's inspired me to focus on solar because there's so much potential if we can make a cost-effective, highly deployable um, technology. Put this in kind of other terms. Um, on this plot, we have a logarithmic scale on the left. So each line here is an order of magnitude higher than the next, so 10 times higher. On the far left is the total solar um, energy hitting the sun. Next to that, which is a thousand times lower, is the amount of energy generated by photosynthesis of every plant on Earth. Next is human consumption, which is another 10 times lower. And then we get to actual renewable energy generation, which is another 10 times lower. And solar today is another 10 times lower. So we have a lot of room to expand deployment of solar. Um, and, and that's what we're looking to figure out ways to do at, at Ubiquitous. What does this mean in terms of area? So, um, this is a map of the United States. The United States uses about four terawatts of that, that 16. Um, if you covered a landmass with solar technologies today, about 15% efficient, you need an area about this big, um, the little green square in the middle, to generate four terawatts of, of power. So pick your favorite state, your least favorite state, and cover it in solar panel, um, and you could power the entire United States. Um, the, the technology is there, um, and if we distribute this, you know, kind of around the world, there's also going to be an economic boon to the places that that deploy solar because it, it actually makes economic sense today. If we zoom in on that square. What does this area mean? So the the little square in the corner 
is the total area of every solar panel made up to today, ever, in the history of the world. That's the area of, of solar PV around the world. So about a small fraction of, of what we need to just power the US. Compare that to you know, newsprint production annually, we get a little bit more area. But what, what I think this highlights is that to be able to harness this energy, we need scaled manufacturing technologies that can actually make, make this material and deploy it in a way that's fast, that's cheap, um, and that, that fits places, we can put places. Um, and this is kind of what got me excited about thinking about incorporating solar into things we're already doing. If you look at, at glass, glass production, if you look at all the glass in the world, now we're starting to get about the size of this entire, entire box. So what if we could actually make solar anytime we're making glass and put it, you know, essentially deploy it when we're installing glass? That's the idea for ubiquitous energy. Um, so diving in a little bit on buildings and windows and why this is such a big opportunity, um, global building stock is already, is already massive, but it's expected to double by the year 2060. And that's the equivalent of adding an entire New York City to the planet every month for the next 40 years. So absolutely huge, huge potential. And this is all materials that ideally we make as sustainable, energy efficient, and even energy generating as possible. Um, because building operations generate about 30% of global carbon emissions. So if we can offset those greenhouse gas emissions by generating electricity on site, um, that's a big opportunity. Within the building, energy use is distributed across a, a lot of different uses. You know, you have your appliances, you have your, um, you have lighting as a big component, but then your heating and cooling is the other component. So if you look at cooling, heating, and lighting is the vast majority of the energy consumption in buildings, and these all happen to be influenced by what we call the envelope of, of the building. Uh, essentially how insulating and how much light you let in through the side of your building really impacts how much you need to run your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and how, how bright your lights need to be. Um, so if we want to make buildings more e e efficient, um, we need to maintain a, a very efficient insulating uh, building envelope. Unfortunately, windows are not that efficient compared to other building materials. Um, but why do we like windows? You look at these two pictures. The one on the left, you have these floor-to-ceiling windows. It's a really nice open view out to the world. And the view on the right, you have you know, kind of a more, um, uh, a, a less appealing look, let's say. Um, but your most efficient building is always gonna be the one with less glass because you can make more efficient materials in the envelope because you're letting less of the, the solar energy in and less of the heat you generate out. Um, but that's not good for us as humans because we want spaces that we can work in and live in and be happy in. So these two things are kind of at odds. When you look at a, a window itself, so this is a cross section of a typical, what we call a glass unit, which is the, the window of, of a commercial building, let's say, or a residential building. Um, most windows today are multiple panes, so we call that a glass unit, a two pane or a three pane unit. Um, if you only had one pane, you would just let heat in and out. It's not very insulating. Uh, so any heat outside, if there's a temperature difference between what you want inside and outside, you're just letting heat through, through the glass that you need, then need to counteract with your HVAC system. So the glass industry has combated that by making double-paned units. Um, further, there's all these other processes that are happening, um, one being the, the light energy from the sun. We talked about how much energy there is beating on the earth from the sun that energy can come through the glass and heat up the inside of the room. Uh, that's kind of what you think of as infrared solar heating. Um, so what we do in the glass industry, um, this is not, not ubiquitous energy technology, this is just you know, any glass you know, in a modern building, we apply a coating, a very special coating, onto one of those surfaces of the glass that can reflect away the infrared heat from the sun. And so we can, we can block some of that um, heat transfer through the glass unit. Um, and there have been decades of development and technology development to make glass about as efficient as you can with this, with a standard double pane unit. 
Um, and we can't change that. If we change anything about this, we're gonna make the glass way less efficient. So when we were thinking about building a glass technology at Ubiquitous Energy, the first thing that was you know, completely table stakes, non-starters, we cannot change this base technology. Any glass unit we make that has transparent solar in it has to be as efficient from, a, from an energy saving standpoint as the conventional technology. So this is a quote from um, the CEO of Anderson Corporation, which is the premier window brand in the United States. <clears throat> um, he came to our facility, he sat behind um, a facade of our glass, which was producing power, powering the lighting in the, in the conference room that he was sitting in, and everything clicked. You know, he saw a glass that looked exactly like he was familiar with, which is this, the glass unit I showed on the previous slide. Um, and we really believe we've built this revolutionary technology that can up add the benefit of energy generation to an already energy saving glass unit by adding, by basically changing that coating to be this transparent solar coating without changing anything else. And that's really the key is that it looks exactly the same and performs exactly the same. The picture behind, behind this is an installation that we have at Michigan State University. Um, and what you're looking at here is the, the, um, one of the engineering buildings. Um, and most of the glass you see was already there. Um, this is just the ordinary passive glass. Um, so we installed the glass that's kind of right above the awning. There's kind of this array of small, small glass panes off our pilot line. That's why they're so small. Um, but the point is, is that they look exactly the same. So the color's the same, the transparency is the same. You would not know this is different than the glass that was already there, besides the fact that there's a wire coming out of this that you can plug into things to power. So transparent solar windows do a lot of things. They maintain, they maintain the status quo, which is the transparency of your window, which lets natural lighting in, a good view out to the world, but they add electricity generation without compromise, and they provide that same solar control because at the end of the day, they are a low E, window that can reject infrared heat in just the same way as an ordinary glass. And what this does is it opens up a massive energy potential because now, instead of restricting solar, in the built environment at least, to rooftops, which we should definitely do, we should put solar on any surface we can, um, but in a lot of env environments, that's not possible because there's not enough space. But now we can use the entire vertical surface of buildings as well to generate energy off of glass that we're installing anyways. So we're essentially piggybacking on a massive, massive market by just adding some technology into that glass unit uh, to add this energy generation. <clears throat> and this has been something that architects and, and building designers have wanted for years. Um, the challenge has been that solar technologies to date just don't have the right look. They have trade-offs. They're either really dark, they have obstructions, they're colored, um, they don't look like windows. And so that's where we kind of went into the lab and cooked up a new technology to solve this problem. <clears throat> and that's what we call UE power, which is our transparent solar technology. How this works, and it seems probably like a paradox, how do you make a solar harvesting device that also lets light through? It seems like that shouldn't be possible. This image shows the energy spectrum of sunlight in the background, that's that gray line. This spans the ultraviolet, the visible, and the infrared. But the visible light, which is what we can see, so when we look outside, we see colors, we see light, we're seeing visible light. And that's that, that colored band uh, to the left of this image. But you'll see that it's actually only a portion of the, the total solar energy. Now conventional solar, which has been developed for, for decades, um, is completely opaque, and it's designed really to mimic the spectrum of the sun. So we want to capture, if we want the most efficient solar technology, we want to capture as much sunlight as possible. So we want to capture everything. Ultraviolet, visible light, infrared. This is great for efficiency and for the application you see in this picture, it's perfect. It's, it's, the, most, it's the most efficient, it's cost effective. Um, There's a mature technology that you can deploy today in solar farms and on rooftops. Problem is, is it's not transparent because it captures visible light. And that's a fundamental material property 
of silicon, essentially, which is what these solar cells are made of. So what we did at Ubiquitous Energy was we rethought, what if we made a solar cell that somehow selectively captured the non-visible light in the ultraviolet and the infrared? And now we can have something that's actually fundamentally transparent because it's not absorbing those visible photons, and that's, that's the end result is, is truly transparent solar. Now there's a lot of, it's, it's simple on the outside, but there's a lot of technology within it, and chemistry is really what makes it possible. This is a material science innovation where we have redeveloped semiconductors to be both efficient as a solar material, but very unique in their absorption properties. Um, we use organic chemistry primarily uh, to synthesize these semiconductors from primarily carbon. So they're earth abundant materials. We're not mining anything out of, out of the earth, um, but we're really tuning these dyes. You can think of them as dyes. So like the same as, as the pigments in your clothing or car paints, just engineered to capture that infrared light instead of visible light. Um, So how can this help a building owner? You know, the technology is great, but it has to have uh, you know, a, market, a market pull, a value proposition, kind of an economic uh, benefit to be, to be viable. Um, so kind of the three things we think about are the surface area potential is huge, the compelling energy economics, and increased building value. So on the surface area potential, we kind of talked about this. You know, there's so much glass in the world, and on tall buildings, you have about up to 50 times more space on the glass than you do on the rooftop. So in some cases, this is the only way you can implement on-site renewable energy generation, uh, which is becoming more and more required in lots of, lots, lots of geographies. Um, on the economic side, <clears throat> what we're doing is we're essentially piggybacking on what's already being done. So all the installation of glass, all the manufacturing of glass, all of this stuff is already being done. So our cost adder is very, very small, and so we can get a very quick payback on the energy that's produced of the glass, glass you're already being installed. And now you open yourself up to incentives in, in, certain, um, in certain places, like the US has the uh, investment tax credit for solar. Um, lots of different places have, have places where you can get additional benefits for putting on-site solar. And this just makes your building more efficient. <clears throat> but really the magic here, and what has been our mantra all along at Ubiquitous is to make this a drop-in solution. Um, all the way through, from the way it's incorporated into the products, the product doesn't really look any different to an architect or a building designer or an installer. Um, all the way through to the way it's manufactured. We use the same manufacturing techniques that the glass industry has used for decades, and we've designed the technology to drop right in. And that's been, that's been it's only possible because we required that, and we made that kind of a, a, a dark red line at the start that everything we're gonna do is gonna match as closely as possible to what this market is already used to. And so at the end of the day, you get everything a traditional passive window gives you, all the way from the aesthetics to the thermal performance to the durability to the manufacturability and scalability, and now you get the added benefits of generation, tax credits, operational resiliency, clean energy generation, um, and you can do this at, at very limited cost and very limited um, trade-off from an aesthetic standpoint and kind of the intrusiveness into the building. So just kind of give you an example here. Um, this is a building, a very famous building in Boston, which is you know, where, we, where we, we founded Ubiquitous Energy out of Cambridge, right across the, the river. We could see this building from, from the labs we were working in. This is the Hancock building. It has a lot of glass. If you were to cover all this glass with transparent solar, it would produce the same amount of power as the Westford Solar Park just down the street in Massachusetts, and that park takes up way more, more land. Uh, so just to give you kind of an equivalency of scale, you can actually truly have a vertical solar farm that produces as much power as, as solar farms nearby. And the benefit is it's on site where the energy is being used. So talk just a second about su supply chain and sustainability here. Um, I, 
I was new to the glass industry when, when we started Ubiquitous, and <clears throat> I kind of thought of this as a very, very simplistic view. It's like, you have incoming flat glass, which is, is clear. You make that into that glass unit, that two-pane glass unit, and you sell it to the customer, and they buy it, and they, they do whatever uh, they do with it, and all is, all is easy, and all we need to do is just kind of um, provide a better window unit. It turns out that this supply chain is actually really, really complicated. There's a lot of stakeholders from the architects to the facade engineers to the building owners on the customer side. And then on the manufacturing side, there's lots of steps. You have to put this coating on. There's glass coming from different locations around the world. Um, it's a relatively complex supply chain that has been you know, in harmony for, for decades. Um, the first flat glass is, is about 100 years old. Um, so this is a really, really old school industry that is, is um, very cautious to change what's worked for a very long time, what's profitable now. And so when we were thinking about how do we integrate into this, the key is limiting the disruption. So let them keep all these gray boxes the same and let's just add our technology where it needs to be added. Um, but we still need to have that customer pull. So we need to be in contact with the customer. And so that's what's led us to really ingrain ourselves within the glass industry, forge partnerships with the primary glass manufacturers, which are the largest in the world, the premier brands that have access to the channel, to the customer, and change as little as possible. On the manufacturing side, we've We've done that by being very intentional about the technology and not adding too many bells and whistles into the technology. Um, the images on the top show kind of the conventional uh, manufacturing flow for, for glass. On the far left is when you actually make the flat glass, is when you melt down sand, essentially, and, and form it into flat glass. Then you add a coating onto that glass, and then you form that glass into your glass unit. So all those blue boxes is the process of manufacturing that's been done, done for years. Um, and it just so happens that it's possible to design materials that can be incorporated into those same coding processes. And we restricted ourselves to that. That was really important to us at Ubiquitous, that we find a way to fit into what's already being done at our high value technology, but disrupt as little as possible. So we say disrupt the product, not the supply chain. That's been, our, that's been our key kind of guiding light. And in a lot of cases, it's added um, degrees of difficulty to the technology development. We could think of way more materials if we didn't have to use the same coder, the same equipment that's used. Um, but the problem is, is that then we don't have a clear path to the scale that we need to address this huge problem uh, where we need massive amounts of surface area. Um, and this is what's kind of allowed us to really fit seamlessly into the market, all the way from the manufacturers, the architects, to the property managers and owners, um, to the contractors. So just a few examples here of, of some of our glass in the wild. Um, this was our very first installation. Um, this is in, in Redwood City. And I think I mentioned we, we have a pilot line. Um, the size, these small panes, that's not a limitation of, of the product or the technology. This is just what we make off the pilot line. Um, so we put them in an array that kind of mimics a window. This installation here was the very first glass we installed, first we ever made um, when the pilot line, line came on. Um, and it's, it's powering the lighting that's in the conference room that you're looking out of in the picture on the right. Um, so we gather the energy, um, we store it locally into that room, and then we deploy it into LED lighting um, as one example of, of the energy use you can have for, for transparent solar. We also monitor the performance over time, and this has been really valuable to get um, a wealth of data over years now, um, showing the energy production in different weather cycles um, at different times of day, and having all of that, that data allows us to gain confidence with our customers that as they're planning this out and modeling it into their buildings, they have confidence that, that it works. Um, and they can look at the same data that, that we've generated and. Um, kind of map that onto a building of their design. 
This was some glass we installed with one of our partners. NSG Pilkington is one of the largest glass manufacturers in the world. Um, we've partnered with them for years. Um, we have glass at their technical center. Again, we're monitoring it, they're monitoring it, gaining confidence um, to incorporate this into their portfolio. Um, we have glass at an engineering company in Canada. I really love this picture because um, there's, there's, two, there's two glass arrays here. The one on the right is our glass from Ubiquitous. The one on the left is just ordinary glass. And when we installed, when we shipped them this glass, we had no idea what glass they were putting on, on the other side. Um, and it's really difficult, unless you're you know, really trained uh, into the nuances of glass, it's very difficult to tell the difference between these. And that's the point. Um, it drops right in. It looks the same as any other glass um, that you'd expect. This is the picture you already saw at Michigan State. Um, this was an interesting building um, in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, um, <clears throat> where the building was designed to be um, you know, very energy efficient and have a lot of on-site generation. And the only technology that's really available to do on-site generation now is opaque solar. And if you want to maximize the area, you have to start pasting it on the roof and the walls, and you get the look that you have here. We have panels kind of like on the whole facade of your building, and um, it starts to become like this, this um, quilt, essentially, of solar panels. Um, we installed our glass there as kind of a, another test, test site where you could open up the glass area, still generate electricity without this, this look of the side of the building. So where are we going next? Um, we're going to bigger sizes. Um, and this is kind of where the manufacturability and the scalability has been really valuable to us. Um, we have partnered with equipment manufacturers from the glass industry to scale up the technology um, using the same equipment that they already use to produce glass um, for commercial buildings, floor to ceiling of, of any size. This is a picture of uh, me with a couple of our um, engineering team um, on site at that vendor where we coated our first piece of glass um, that's five foot by 10 foot, which is 1.5 by three meters. Um, three meters is about floor to ceiling glass. Um, so if you flip this uh, 90 degrees, you can imagine that being your floor to ceiling glass. Um, it works beautifully. It's completely, uni our materials are completely uniform across the glass. Um, it looks, you know, looks highly transparent. And we're really excited about now building our first manufacturing line for, for, for this full scale glass to supply our customers and the increasing demand we have for this product. And so what I wanna leave you with is kind of the potential, and you know, this is very specific to ubiquitous energy, but I think um, the, same, the same sort of ideas and kind of like just having in mind the scale of the impact of whatever solution you're developing, I think is really important as sort of a guiding light for, for any venture. Um, at ubiquitous, it's really about the the size of the glass market is so big, um, and it's really hard to fathom the size of this. So 20 billion square feet per year of windows are installed around the world each year. Um, that is enough glass if you tied it end to end of that, the same size I showed here. So this size glass, end to end around the world, would go around the world 100 times. That's installed every single year. What if all of that glass was producing energy? If all of that glass, all the glass that's installed in the world today was producing electricity, we would be generating 10% of global carbon emissions. We'd be offsetting with energy generation without really doing anything different. It's, it's just glass, so we're really not disrupting anything. We're just adding this extra sustainability idea of energy generation into the products that we're already using. And this is really exciting to me. It's what energizes me um, to get up in the morning. Um, and it's, it's kind of what started 10 years ago at MIT and at um, you know, thinking about how to build uh, a business in renewable and sustainable energy. And this is where it's taken us. So with that, I will close. I thank you for your attention. And um, I hope you're motivated. I, I am super excited about the potential of, of lots of different technologies to help make our world more sustainable um, and the creative solutions that entrepreneurs around the world and hopefully in this audience are coming up with now and we'll see, we'll see uh, in, in the wild in the, in the coming years. So um, with that, I will stop and I think we have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. This was great. 
So please put your questions on Eventora. Eventora, please. Uh, I have here a couple of questions. So there have been a lot of questions actually about the whole technology. So many are asking, um, we see that the angle is very important, right? So windows are fixed in buildings and does that uh, make any sense? How much of a building we can actually equip? Others are asking, is your business scalable because there's a lot of old buildings and then how does that work? Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. Um... So it's a good, good point. You typically see solar panels facing either horizontally or at a slight angle. <clears throat> and what, you're, what they're doing there is they're pointing the solar panel at the angle that sees the most total solar insulation over the course of a, a day or a year. Um, but most of those solar panels are still fixed and the sun is moving. So even a conventional panel that's in a field or on a rooftop is seeing sunlight at lots of different angles. That's the same as, as our technology. We just happen to fix the angle vertically. And what that does is it, it does cut down the total amount of solar insulation that that plane, plane of array, sees over the course of the day, but not as substantially as you might think. It's kind of that aggregate energy as the sun moves over, over the building. You actually get some interesting benefits that were not intuitive to me at first, where if you put this on every side of your building, you actually get a reasonably steady stream of power production because in the morning, you're getting sunlight on one face where that, that face is producing the most energy. The others are still producing energy, but one is, one is getting more. And as the sun moves over, you're, because you're collecting energy from all angles on different faces, you can produce power over all parts of the day, which can have value to kind of sustainability of the grid and intermittency of the grid. Um, but in general, the short answer is you can produce power from any angle you want. Um, it's all just about the, the total energy um, hitting those surfaces. And kind of to put that into context, if you model this kind of like on the Hancock building there where you have this building that's covered on all sides with glass, over the course of a year, you would generate about 30% of that building's electricity needs just from the sides of the building, even accounting for the angle and the fact that they're, they're at kind of like vertical, vertical incidents. And the other question was? <laughs> yeah, so basically I think you answered a little bit, but the scaling, the scaling of the business given the old buildings, I would say. Ah, old buildings, yeah. So if you think about kind of building stock, so we, we have that new, new glass coming in every year to 20 billion square feet. That's coming in to a combination of, of new and old buildings. I think it's leaning a little bit more towards new buildings, but some of that does go to retrofit. But it's the same glass either way. The glass is coming from the same production, and you're either popping out the old glass to put that in. Typically, you would do that if you had an older style building with maybe a single pane glass that wasn't very insulating. So if you want to upgrade the insulation, you might add a double pane glass. And when you're doing that, you could just drop right in a power producing version from from, from our technology. Um, so it's, it's really applicable to either retrofit buildings or new installation. The glass, the product itself is the same either way. And maybe a second question and last, because I know we're running out of time and you will be on the panel next, so I'm sure everyone can ask more questions. Um, there is a lot of buzz in, uh, with sustainable technologies. How do you differentiate between the hype and what's real and what's gonna work? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, staying power is important and I think, you know, it's hard, it's really hard, because especially when you see you know, reports at different stages of maturity, it's hard to tell how many gates that technology has passed through. Um, and if you think about, you know, I can map it onto our technology, there's a lot of things that have to go right for this to work. You have to have material that's low enough cost. You have to have material that's reliable and durable, that's scalable, you can make enough of it, that's earth abundant, that, you know, that has actually been manufactured, that has been put into the exact same equipment that's gonna make this at scale at a smaller size. And from you know, just, just reading a quick article um, about any given technology, it's really hard to, to kind of like ascertain if, if that technology has already met all those things. Um, so really I think you're left kind of seeing like, you know, watching it over time, seeing if that technology or that company or, or, or you know, whatever the case may be, is progressing and is gaining interest from you know, established um, you know, customers, essentially, people who are gonna buy it that also believe it's real. Um, at the end of the day, that, that's what matters, is, is somebody gonna buy this 
And they're only going to buy it if you can make it and it's real. So at the end of the day, that's the final barometer. Great. Thank you so much, Miles. And thank you again. Let's give him a round of applause. And we will see him very shortly in our next panel. So I let you go.